about the old ones anymore. Be glad, rejoice forever in my creation. And look, I will create Jerusalem as a place of happiness, where people will be a source of joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and delight in my people, and the sound of weeping and crying will be heard in it no more. No longer will babies die when only a few days old. No longer will adults die before they have lived a full life. No longer will people be considered old at 100. Only the cursed will die that young. In those days, people will live in the houses they build and eat the fruit of their own vineyards. Unlike the past, invaders will not take their houses and confiscate their vineyards, for my people will live as long as trees, and my chosen ones will have time to enjoy their hard-won gains. They will not work in vain, and their children will not be doomed to misfortune. For they are people blessed by the Lord. And their children too will be blessed. I will answer them before they even call to me. While they are still talking about their needs, I will go ahead and answer their prayers. The wolf and the lamb will feed together. The lion will eat hay like a cow. But the snakes will eat dust. In those days, no one will be hurt or destroyed on my holy mountain. I, the Lord, have spoken. Some of his disciples began talking about the majestic stonework of the temple and the memorial decorations on the walls. But Jesus said, The time is coming when all these things will be completely demolished. Not one stone will be left on top of another. Teacher, they asked, When will all this happen? What sign will show us that these things are about to take place? He replied, Don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name. Claiming, I am the Messiah, and saying, The time has come, but don't believe them. And when you hear of wars and insurrections, don't panic. Yes, these things must take place first, but the end won't follow immediately. Then he added, Nation will go to war against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, and there will be famines and plagues in many lands, and there will be terrifying things and great miraculous signs from heaven. But before all this occurs, there will be a time of great persecution. You will be dragged into synagogues and prisons, and you will stand trial before kings and governors, because you are my followers. But this will be your opportunity to tell them about me. So don't worry in advance about how to answer the charges against you, for I will give you the right words and such wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to reply or refute you. Even those closest to you, Parents, brothers, relatives, and friends will betray you. They will even kill some of you, and everyone will hate you because you are my followers. But not a hair of your head will perish. By standing firm, you will win your souls. God's word through the prophet Isaiah for the people of Israel, Jesus' words to his disciples, um, and God's word to us this day and for all people everywhere. Uh, thanks be to God. So there have been television shows chronicling engineering catastrophes, engineering fails, disasters, you know, however you want to put it. And now all you need to do is just type in the search bar, you know, engineering catastrophes, and, and you'll get um, a, a ton of, of websites. YouTube has a ton of videos. Now some of the ca catastrophes are bridges rippling as if you were shaking a, a sheet in the wind. There are others which show two halves of bridges because you know they built not meeting in the middle. Um, there are some that just collapse because of miscalculations. In fact, I had read one time that, that the bridges, um, Texas A&M, you know, they have like a famous marching band and whatnot, but when they would cross the bridges um, practicing, they had to vary their cadence uh, because the content, constant same cadence would bring the bridge down. 
There are dams which, which could not keep water from destroying those things in its path. Uh, engineers failing to take into account all of the necessary things when it came to design, or those in charge um, were not willing to follow the engineer's guidance due to budget concerns, or, or more like they wanted money, money, money. And who can forget the Hindenburg or the Titanic? And yes, it was an engineering fail which allowed an iceberg to take down the ship. Or the Challenger space shuttle, um, which, which many of you all may have watched, myself as well, in horror as it, as it blew up in the sky. Its joint seals were not designed to withstand the cold conditions of the day of the launch. Who thought it would be 28 degrees in Florida in January? It was January, though. And Chernobyl and Three Mile Island, engineering catastrophes. Structures collapsing due to faulty foundations or failed calcul calculations when it came to load-bearing walls and beams. There was a tea party in Kansas City in 1981 that left 114 people dead. Uh, a design change left a walkway, or they called it a bridge, barely able to hold its own weight, much less any others. Uh, the guests at the party. And not too long ago, we saw a condominium in Florida um, falling to the ground. Oops. The walls came crumbling down. And there are several places in Scripture where we also find walls crumbling to the ground, uh, but for reasons other than the lack of structural integrity miscalculations of the engineering kind. The one could say that integrity was a part of all those catastrophes and the predicted fails. So I want to explore those crumbling walls today, especially the one that Jesus predicted in our reading from the Gospel of Luke. But before I do, let us pray. <clears throat> Almighty and most merciful God, I come before you this day praying the words I'm about to share won't be catastrophic. They won't be a disaster, but rather they will be your words of caution and encouragement. Uh, Holy Spirit, move in power, and may we feel your presence. Uh, speak in us and to us. Speak in me and to me that you might speak through me and in spite of me. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you, O oh Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Now, maybe the most infinite, in, infamous story about crumbling walls in scripture is about the walls surrounding Jericho. Uh, Jericho was the city that the people of Israel would first encounter as they went uh, into the wilderness through the Jordan River into the, I'm sorry, into the promised land uh, through the Jordan River from the wilderness where they had been wandering for 40 years. Jericho was a fortified city. There was a wall surrounding it. The, the gates taught, taught, oh my goodness, where, where are my words today? Breathe. <laughs> The gates shut tight. And you might know the story. The Lord gave Joshua instructions on how to capture this city. And it wasn't about uh, lining up the soldiers, but instead it was about marching around the city and, and on the seventh day with the ram's horn blown and, and then the people giving a great shout. The walls came crumbling down. The battle plans also included total destruction, except those things made of iron and bronze and gold and silver. Those spoils of war, though, weren't to be divided among the warriors, but instead put into the Lord's treasury. And for the most part, the Israelites followed the instructions. Until they didn't. They made promises to obey God, to trust God, to follow God. And while initially the Israelites' integrity um, brought the walls of Jericho down, the lack of continued integrity would later find the walls come crumbling down around them. Wait and see. Now, if we were to fast forward to Solomon building the temple for the Lord, it was beautiful and it was ornate. Though not as big or beautiful or ornate as Solomon's temple, uh, that's a different story for a different day. Though an argument could be made that this fact in indicated in some ways Solomon's lack of integrity. But the temple, the Ark of the Covenant, containing the Ten Commandments, the mercy seat where, where God sat in the Holy of Holies, beautiful, ornate. That the people where, the place where the people of Israel would come to worship the songs and prayer, the sacrifices, though for the most part, they also came with a lack of integrity. 
The Old Testament is full of instances of disobedience by the Israelites. They wouldn't bring their full offering to God. They wouldn't bring the best of the best. They would oppress their own people and the foreigners in their midst. They didn't provide for the widows and orphans. They cheated people using dishonest weights and measures. They made treaties with foreign nations, uh, the, the kings and, and the men having many wives and concubines. The Israelites would also construct altars and, and to false gods in the temple, even sacrificing their own children to these pagan gods. And thus, coming to that temple with the lack of integrity, it's no wonder that the walls of Jerusalem, the walls of the temple, would come crumbling down. As the Israelites were captured by the Babylonians, they were led into exile. Their city, their homes, the temple, in ruins, in rubble. Those things which were considered holy were carried off as pieces of metal, valuable only in terms of money, not in their sacredness. The Israelites lacked integrity. They weren't willing to be holy and set apart. They weren't willing to live up to their promise to love the Lord their God with heart, soul, mind, and strength. They weren't willing to be countercultural. They weren't willing to be a light to the nations. And though the prophets would tell the people of Israel to get themselves together while they were in exile, to live as the people that they were called to be, as, as holy as God is holy, to be that royal priesthood, uh, to worship God alone, to, to bring the sacrifice, the, not, uh, not just of the fatted calf, not, not just of, 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 of the, their grain, but of themselves. Not just to fast from food, but, but to, to leave sin behind. Guess what, though? That didn't happen. And the walls surrounding Jerusalem, the walls of the temple, were reduced to rubble. Now, the Israelites in captivity, living in a foreign land, longed for home. They longed for the temple. It, truly, though, failing to know that God wasn't constrained in the walls of that, those buildings. But they wanted then to know when. When will we be able to return? They didn't seem overly concerned as to why they were in this predicament. They just wanted to know when. There would come a time when they were able to return to Jerusalem to rebuild. Uh, first, the temple was rebuilt, led by Ezra, and we talked a little bit about that rebuild last week. And then Nehemiah would come in and rebuild the walls. And you would think that the people of Israel would finally understand that obedience to God would bring blessings. Uh, the temple being filled with the glory of the Lord, the, the people being that light to the nations. Nope. <laughs> As, and the walls would come crumbling down once more. The walls would be reconstructed by the Maccabees soon afterward, and though Herod the Great would spend 46 years expanding the temple, uh, not for the glory of God, but a statement of, of his wealth, the, the temple in all of its splendor, a testimony to him as an earthly king, devoid of the Lord. Now enter Jesus. Enter the, the words that he spoke to his disciples. He said, you know what? The temple is going to be destroyed. Not to, the, the temple is going to be destroyed. It's going to be reduced to rubble. And what did they ask? They said, well, teacher, when is that going to happen? You would think that, that, that they would look at Jesus and go, huh? I mean, you know, you're here. You claim to be the Messiah. Why would the temple be destroyed? They wanted to know when. I don't know what the first question you all would ask. Need my sunglasses. But, um, but I'm not sure I would. Well, maybe I would ask when. But surely they would. They would wonder why. Interesting to note, though, if we were to go back to the the what what had happened right before, uh, right before this this conversation about the temple being destroyed. They're, they were at the temple, and there was a widow who came, and she put in uh, her offering to the widow's mite, is what it's called, two coins, seemingly very small. But Jesus said, look, look at her offering. That offering is greater than, than what you've put in the plate. Kind of like, what? Well, you've got to see that the widow didn't have much, and she didn't have a way to earn much, and yet her offering bigger than what they put in the plate. 
because it was a sacrifice. And then Jesus leads with, eh, the temple is going to be destroyed again. And their question is, when? Talk about a change of, in the subject, right? There was a, I'm sure that there was a discomfort. There was a means by, by which, man, we don't want to talk about why her sacrifice uh, was, is more important than, well, just a part of what we have. Jesus, they ask when and not why. It happens in the church as well quite often. I know even yesterday we had conversation around the table that was looking at a bank account and asking when will, be, when will it be the end. When I first came here in 2013, we had that same conversation and the answer was six months. I'm in my 10th year, folks, you know? But the question seems to always be when and not why. Jesus uh, begins to answer them, and as Jesus is off to do, um, he, it's, it's not a date, it's not a time, but instead, instead he, he begins to weave this picture. He begins to exp explain and describe the when, which is the why. He starts with, don't let people mislead you. People will come and claim to be the Messiah. Now, Jesus is the Messiah, but Jesus wasn't the Messiah that they were expecting. It wasn't the Messiah that, that they thought they wanted. They were expecting a Messiah that, that would indeed keep the temple in all of its strength and all of its glory. A Messiah that would allow them to conquer Rome and to be this uh, political um, mainstay. A kingdom here on earth, not thinking about the kingdom that, that God wanted to build in heaven the new creation, he speaks, too, about all of those things in this world which would happen in earthquakes and famines and, and, and nations at war with nations and kingdoms against kingdoms. And I'm sure they're going, okay, uh, that, that, and, and thus those that were coming to claim that they were the Messiah, surely there would be a hope that, well, at least a consideration that, oh, that Jesus guy, he couldn't have been the Messiah because here we are still fighting here we are still trying uh, to, to be powerful, but powerful in the ways of the world. When will the temple be destroyed? And Jesus says, look around. Don't be misled. And he talks about persecution. He talks about, about being dragged into prisons and dragged out of the, the prison, standing trial before the kings and governors because they follow. These things are going to happen. That's the answer to when. And I, I mean, I imagine the disciples are sitting there going, that's not the question we asked Jesus. Could you give us a, a date and a time? But instead, he explains what will happen. And, and the when, the, the when is, is that in that time where the world would come to know Jesus. He, he says to them that I'll give you the right Words that this is going to be an opportunity to tell the world about me, to let the world know that though it is collapsing around us, around you, that the Messiah has come, that the Deliverer has come, that there's that there's salvation and redemption, that there is a world beyond this. At the outset of Jesus's ministry, and it is one of the things that that got him in trouble. Jesus says, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. The Jews said it took 46 years to build this temple, and you'll raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. When? When will the temple be rebuilt? The temple will be rebuilt in the, in when God's kingdom comes here on earth as it is in heaven. Until then, though, the church is called to be the representation of Christ in this world. When will the temple be rebuilt? Maybe we should be asking the, the question, or the, looking, um, looking to that. The when? The when is when the church when the church brings people 
to know Christ as the Messiah. The when is, is when God's word is shared to every tribe and nation and race. The when isn't a date and a time, and too often we get hung up in that. Too often we look at what's going on in the world right now and say, hey, Jesus has got to come, is going to come back soon. But look at the empty pews, guys, not just in this church. The when, the when is when these pews are, are full, and, and, and when the church is outside of these walls. The when is, when is the, the temple going to be destroyed? When is it going to fall down? It's going to fall down uh, the, the church. When the, the temple here is going to fall, when God's kingdom comes, Jesus Christ, who says the, the structure, that's not where I'm present. The, the structure is not where people will come to know Christ, will come to know me, but it is in sacrifice. It is in the, the, the giving, the agape love, the serving, the denying yourself and taking up your cross. And the scripture passage I was trying to, to, to pray. You know, what does it profit you to gain the whole world but to lose your soul? The, the when? The when is when the world comes to know Christ. And, and I think in, in that question... <laughs> In that, we also need to be asking the why. The why, not just the when. We need to, to be then, you know, paying attention to the answer. The answer that, that Jesus is giving in, in terms of, of why? Because, because these walls don't contain the presence of God. Why is the temple, this building, going to, to, to come to the ground? Because it is, it is built in this impressive way where you are looking at the stones, where you are looking at the memorial walls, where you are thinking about what, what was and not what will be. That's why the temple is going to come crumbling down at the building that was in Jerusalem. Because God cannot be contained in a building. When is the temple going to come, uh, come crumbling down? I would say that when is when the church... When the church indeed embodies Jesus Christ for the world. The, the win is when God's kingdom comes here on earth. Um, Peter writes, the Lord isn't tarrying, but instead waiting. Waiting for all to know Jesus Christ. The question comes, do you know Christ? Do you know him as Lord and Savior? Do you know him as the one who, who provides, as the one who heals, as the one who redeems, as the one who offered uh, himself as a sacrifice? Do you know God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as the one you can trust, as the one who will provide? Do you know Christ, the all in all? Is that relationship important to you? Is that relationship one you understand for the whole world? And if it is, then, then why? Why hasn't the church left the building to serve? Yes, we come together to worship, and that is important. But do you leave to serve? Do you leave to share the gospel to the whole world? I think that the disciples changed the subject uh, from the widow's might, from her sacrifice, to, to this, this means about the, the temple. <clears throat> because, you know, Jesus did present them uh, with, with this fact that the temple's going to come crumbling to the ground. But they started thinking about structures and, and not contemplating the sacrifice of the giving. They changed the subject because it's difficult. It is difficult and countercultural to live a, a life for Christ. And, and he says, you know, guess what? It's going to be hard. I mean, who wants to sign up for being persecuted? Who wants to be signed up to, for being drugged into prison? I mean, I wouldn't be first in line. And yet, that's what we are called to. And it is when we are willing to offer ourselves as a holy and living sacrifice, it is when we are willing to put God first, 
versus our, our pocket, versus our stuff, versus the things that we want to do. Not that you don't get to do things, not that, that you don't get to, to have what you need. But when we're willing to put God first, when we are willing to, to follow as a disciple, when we're willing as the widow uh, to give even more than she than, than what uh, was required, when the widow, when we are like that, when we do the hard things, the countercultural things, that that is when God's kingdom here comes on earth as it is in heaven. That is when that is when the walls come tumbling down, and the why so that the world might be redeemed. What are we looking at to determine the when? The when? Are we looking at bank accounts? Are we looking at empty pews? Are we looking at crumbling buildings? When will the church cease to exist? Or are we looking at the why are we looking at the, the why? Are we looking to ourselves as the church to, to, to bring us to the win? Not because, not because we run out of money, not because we run out of people, but because the world comes to know Christ. Or do you just want me to change the subject? I do want to challenge you. I challenge myself. I actually had a conversation with my neighbor this week, inviting him to church, uh, right around the corner at Lodge Forest, where I live. Um, and I will confess, it's hard for me as well, so I'm not going to say it's not hard for you all. But yet, but yet, that is what we are called to do. And we are called to give. And sometimes we are called to give in, in ways where we sacrifice those things that we want, not need. Sometimes we are called, I say all the time, we are called to be willing to sacrifice our time in service to the Lord. Not to carve out time for God, but to carve out that time for the, for the other. Putting God first and foremost in all aspects of our lives as our priority should I change the subject? The win isn't about stuff, isn't about the things of this world, but the win is, is when we take, we are the church in the world. As the church began after Christ's death, as the church began, as Christ brought the temple back three days later from the cross to the empty tomb, the church was called the way, and people were all struggling with it. And, and one, of the, the, um, one of the leaders in the Jewish community said, guess what? If this is of nothing, it'll fall away. It's first century. We're in the 21st, yeah, 21st century. And, and with that, the church is still standing because the win hasn't come. Because the church is still needing to be the hands and feet, the face and, and the ears and the mouthpiece and the eyes of, of Christ. The church hasn't fallen away, but it's looking like it's mighty close and not for the reason that it ought to be. Friends, will we be like the widow? Will we be, will we follow Christ's instructions to deny ourselves? Will we indeed live as redeemed and, and delivered people? Will we live as citizens of the kingdom of God that the new creation might come and the world will know? I do challenge you as you leave today, as you go about your week, to, to begin thinking, what is my priority here? Is it God, or is it what I want? Again, not that God is some taskmaster, but is God that priority in making those decisions? I gotta ask myself that question as well. I got plenty of places in my life where, where I would have to answer no. So I'm gonna try to accept that challenge with you all this week, with you to, to, to think first,
about making that decision according to God's will, of making a decision uh, to sacrifice some of what I want to live as how God has called me. Will you join me this week? So it is good and right now to, to pray a prayer of confession to offer to the Lord those places even now where we're falling short, to receive his forgiveness, to move forward into a life uh, which by the power of the Holy Spirit can be lived, uh, devoid of conscious sin. So just as the prophet Isaiah assured God's people so many years ago, he assures us now, God is our salvation. It is because of that confidence, because of that promise, that we dare approach God with our confession. Let us pray. A God of peace, we confess we are people of fear. We have let anxiety rule our days and worry our nights. We have been distracted by nerves and focused on tension. We confess we have ignored your command to not be afraid. We've allowed fear to keep us from trusting you and serving others. Now offer your personal confessions. We continue in prayer. Forgive us, O God, calm our hearts, settle our stomachs, and renew in us the ability to find our comfort in you. Amen. The prophet Isaiah also assures us that God is building a new heaven and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered or come to mind. Forgiven and freed, let us rejoice in what the Lord is creating in you, in me, in all of creation. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you now, as you are able to stand and join in singing, uh, ask you what great things I know, hymn number 163. 